Good evening, and I do want to welcome you to our Wednesday evening service, our time of uh, praise, prayer, and, and the preaching of God's Word. Uh, let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to be singing together, Higher Ground, and then Brother Harry is going to come and lead us in a time of prayer. Let's go to him now. Heavenly Father, we praise you this evening. We thank you for the blessing of gathering in your name. We're thankful, Lord God, for this opportunity to uh, lift up others in intercessory prayer, uh, to lift up uh, praises to you, to the name of Jesus. And we pray, Lord God, uh, that as we open up your word, as we continue to look upon uh, a faith that loves, that you will speak to our hearts. Uh, help us, Lord, not only to uh, demonstrate through the way we live our, our love for you, but Lord, also our love for one another. We praise you, and it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, let's sing Higher Ground together. Good evening. It's good to be with you today. I am coming from the uh, the prayer room on the campus of First Baptist Church. Uh, it's kind of special to be in here, uh, first of all, to have a room dedicated solely to prayer and to communication with God. Uh, but secondly, uh, knowing how many prayer warriors have spent significant time in this room and so as I come to lead us in our prayer time this week, um, I know that you are joining me. I know that you are praying from your prayer room also. And so I want to share with you some of our prayer concerns. Uh, first of all, we want to pray for our church leaders during this time. 
I want to pray for our pastor. Uh, he has never faced a COVID-19 crisis before, and this is different. So pray for our pastor and for our staff. Uh, I really appreciate the efforts of all of those who have, who have worked to be creative in meeting the needs of our congregation this time and, and during uh, learning how to use uh, video ministries, online ministries. It's been, a, it's been a sharp learning curve. So pray for our pastor and, and for our staff as we devise creative meeting, means of, of ministering. Uh, pray for our homebound. Uh, many of our elderly are, are, are concerned during this time and we want to pray for them. We certainly want to pray for revival. Uh, as we all have more time uh, to be in prayer and Bible study, uh, this is a, a time that God can speak to us and bring about revival, and especially at those times when we return to, to the church building to be able to gather together. We want to pray for our nation and for our state and, and local leaders. We want to pray for missions in our areas. Uh, we have gotten a number of... Um, of emails recently of, of mission needs in our areas that that we can help and if you'd like to to help with some of those uh, give us a call at the church office and we'll be glad to to share those with you uh, our mission area of the week is Johnny Moust uh, Johnny lives in Ecuador and he's working with dealing uh, with reaching the Afro Ecuadorian people group uh, he's been praying for a man named Leo who is a fisherman who would not profess his faith in Christ, but uh, one day Johnny gave an audio Bible to Leo, and Leo listened to it regularly and got a, a, a message uh, to, to Johnny eventually that, that Leo was ready to hear the message of God, to accept God as his, as his Savior. So there are all sorts of ways of reaching people for Christ. We also want to pray for a sister church in our association, Ebenezer Baptist Church and their pastor, Dr. David Wick. We want to lift them up and pray for them. And today we want to pray for our Florence Police, police Chief, uh, Alan Heidler. Uh, many of you may not know that my daddy uh, was uh, Chief of Police in the little town in South Alabama that I grew up. So that's kind of a special prayer for me. Uh, would you join me in praying for these as we go to the Lord right now? Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your, for your leadership, for your guidance, for your counsel, uh, for your encouragement during times like this. And Lord, on behalf of the, the congregation of First Baptist Church of Florence, I lift up these concerns tonight to you to, to hear them. Uh, also, Father, to hear the concerns from our heart. Uh, we want to pray for our pastor and for our staff, Lord, as they work to to minister in a changing community as they work to find creative ways of, of reaching people for Christ. And Lord, we are, we are so excited about the response that we've seen to our online ministries. Father, we want to pray for our governor, for our, our president, for our governor, uh, for our city leaders. And Father, we lift them up. We want to pray, Lord, for our association and for the ministries around us. I pray, Lord, for Chris Smith and the staff of our Florence Baptist Association. And Father, we want to pray for Johnny Moust in, uh, in Ecuador. Thank you, Lord, for giving him creativity in reaching peoples there for Christ, in sharing the Word of God with them, and in leading them to a saving knowledge of the Lord. Father, we do want to pray for our sister church, Ebenezer Baptist, and for their, for their, their pastor, Dr. David White. Lord, I pray that you would bless them and that, Father, you would work through them uh, as they minister to the, to the people of, of their area. And, Father, we want to pray for today uh, our Florence Police Chief, Alan Heidler. Lord, lift him up and, Father, strengthen him. I don't know if he's a believer, but, Father, I pray that you would give him wisdom during these times and that, Father, you'd give him patience and that, Father, as he leads our police force, that, uh, Father, he might do so in a Christ-like manner. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. We also want to lift up some personal prayer requests uh, from our congregation, and I know that many of you have, have uh, unspoken requests or family requests, uh, friends in your neighborhood and like that, and, and I, when I pray with you, I encourage you to lift them up. 
we want to continue to pray for Morris Anderson, uh, for Hank Anderson. We pray for Flory Andrews. We pray for Aaron Baer. Uh, we pray for Dana Boatwright, who is a friend of our congregation. Uh, we pray for Lynn Brown and for Michelle Budding. We pray for Anna Carter and for Sandy Carter, for William Chandler, for Jennifer Cockfield, for Mary Catherine Coleman, for Dolores Davis, for John Davis, for Sarah Dove, for Mike Easton, Beth Four, Francis Floyd, Angela Gardner, Ruth Grayson. We pray for Gail Harley as she continues to recover from surgery, from Wayne and Adri Hicks, for Richard Hewling, for Patty Huntley, Linda Jenkins, Bill Johnson. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you've ministered in the life of Joyce Larimore for Debbie Waters Lindrum, for Glenn Martin, for Miriam Moody, for my brother-in-law, Hooper Mara, for Gillian Plasman, for Mike Mark Rennock, for Kay Richards, Diane Richardson, Lanier Singleton, Carter Smith, Oliver Smith, Jimmy Walsh, Laura Waters, and for Nellie and Buddy Watts. Let's pray together. Father, we lift up these names that we have called out today. Father, I know that there are many, many more of unspoken requests and, and perhaps prayer needs that we have just not heard of yet. But I pray, Father, that you would hear uh, the prayer request of, of our congregation today, tonight, as we lift these up and as we pray for their needs. And we ask you, Lord, to be the great physician, the great healer, uh, the great comforter in all of these needs. But Father, we also know that beyond these that we've listed vocally, there are also others, unspoken requests, family members, Lord, that are lost, family members, Lord, that, uh, that are going through tough times and struggles, family members who are, who are fearful of the, the COVID-19 virus. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you would reach out with, through your Holy Spirit to comfort and strengthen your people. Give us hope, Father, for the future, to know that this will pass, to know, Lord, that you are still in control, and to know, Lord, that we still have the obligation to reach out and to tell people about Jesus Christ and his love for us. Bless us, Father, as a church congregation. I pray, Lord, that we'll be able to meet together physically again very, very soon. But in the meantime, Father, protect us and give us creativity as we reach out and as we minister to the needs of, of those around us. Thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace, and your mercy toward us. And thank you, Father, for meeting us here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to again thank Brother Harry for leading us in a time of uh, prayer. And uh, if you will, go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 John. Uh, we're in chapter 2 this evening. We'll be looking at verses 3 through 14. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. Uh, Jesus spoke about the, the two greatest commandments in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. We're to love God, that's the first great commandment, but the second is likened unto it, we're to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Jesus emphasized these two great commandments by concluding on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Our purpose statement here at First Baptist Church is to love God uh, to love God and love people. Um, we truly have a faith that loves. And as we continue our, our series of studies, a faith that we profess, and we can continue in our, our study through First, Second, and Third John, a faith that loves, throughout these epistles, what we'll find is that love will be the constant uh, uh, theme. No matter what the topic is, love remains to be the theme throughout uh, John's epistles. Um, now, there's a popular argument that has uh, been around for ages. Uh, the argument uh, really comes down to this. If God is love, then why evil? If God is love, then why is there evil in this world? Why do bad things happen to good people? Um, it's, it's a legitimate argument uh, that is often brought out 
because people do not understand the love of God or they do not believe that there is a God or perhaps they do not believe that God interacts and is intimate with his creation. Um, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, as well as verse 16, the word of God says, God is love. You and I, we understand that God loves us. He loves us, uh, for John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world, and that speaks of all of us, but the truth of the, of the matter is God loves us personally. And because God is love, because God's love loves us and because God has placed his love within us. Romans 5 8 says God demonstrates his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love of God he has for us. But then in Romans chapter 5 verse 5, the word uh, Paul writes about how God's love is placed into us by the Holy Spirit. So we've got God is love, God loves us, and God's love is in us. So why is this important right now? Well, we have a faith that we profess. We have a faith that loves. And uh, to change and alter the previous question just a little bit, some would ask if God is love, if God loves us, then why would we go through something such as this pandemic that is taking place? Now, I would not pretend to have all of the answers, but if I understand, if I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is love, that God loves me, then I can rest on some certainties. For instance, I am certain that it will work out for our good. Romans chapter 5 and verse 28 teaches us that. I am certain that even through this pandemic, where we have these temporary separations from one another, Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans 8.35 teaches us that. And I can know for certain that even in the midst of this pandemic, God will be glorified. Uh, again, I don't have all the answers to the numerous questions that we can come up with as to why and what's going to happen and all the uncertainties in this, in, in this life. But we can rest on the, the certainty that God is love and that he loves me, that he loves you. We have a faith that loves. So we can now go out and love others as God would have us. Uh, I asked you earlier to turn in your Bibles to uh, 1 John chapter 2. Where we're going to be looking at verses 3 through 14. And I asked a a, 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 uh, I want to ask a, a question right up front because that's the question, that's the title of this evening's message. Uh, and it's something we really need to ask ourselves over and over again. And the question is simply this, who do you know? So keep that question in mind and uh, let's turn in our Bibles and I'll begin reading First John chapter 2 beginning in verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who, ab uh, he ab he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which uh, thing is true in him and in you, in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, uh, are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is uh, from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome 
the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the reading of your word. We thank you for your precious love. We thank you, Lord God, that you love us intimately. And we're thankful, Lord God, that your love is in us and can be seen through us and shared with others. Bless this time in the teaching of your word. Speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit and through your word. For it's in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. There is a saying, no doubt, that you've heard before that goes something like this. It's not necessarily what you know, but who you know. When we think about our Christian faith, we do need both of those things. We need to know, but it's really and ultimately about who you know. Uh, Hence the title of this passage or this message and the question I posited at the very beginning. Who do you know? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, where we began this message, it says, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. Who do we know? With this in mind, uh, this passage uh, we just read presents to us three distinctions uh, that should assist us in answering that question or the many questions that come with it. So let's uh, look at these three distinctions. The first distinction we find in the evidence provided, the evidence provided. We see this in verses three through six uh, by having the evidence of knowing God. Now, what are these evidences that we have of knowing God? Well, to get to that, I want us to look at a, a definition, a demonstration, and a development. And we, we can discover these evidences in our lives that we know that we have a personal relationship with God. And so let's begin with the definition of knowing God. Now by this we know that we know him. Uh, that, that, that word know uh, as used in the Greek is the same root word that makes up um, what we would know as Gnostic or the Gnostics, which was a religion uh, that really uh, believed they had a secret knowledge of God, a secret knowledge about Christ, uh, uh, that that you can only know and have this knowledge if you follow us and you do the things that we do and you get to a certain point and, and perhaps you will be blessed with this special secret knowledge. The Gnostics, uh, they boasted on about having a superior knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Apostle Paul was frequently uh, battling against the Gnostics as they would come in after he had left the place. They would come in and try to preach a completely different gospel in which he tells us in Galatians is no gospel at all. Uh, John is addressing the Gnostics as well. Uh, it, but, but the question is, really, what's the definition of knowing God? Well, to know means more than just uh, possessing facts and details about, in this case, deity, God, Uh, Let me give you an an example. Um, I can tell you that I know James Gardner. Now, many people might not uh, know who James Gardner. He was the actor. He was famous for being on the Rockford Files. I know James Gardner. In fact, I was able to meet James Gardner when I was a youth. I was able to shake his hands and, and speak with him for a few moments. But do I really know who he is. Uh, It wasn't until I googled his name just uh, this week that I found out his name is actually James Scott Bumgarner, not James Gardner, uh, James Scott Bumgarner. I guess Bumgarner did not look good on the screen, and so he had his name changed changed to James Gardner. Uh, What could be said about me knowing James Gardner is I know of him, but I really don't know him. You see, to know means more than just having facts and details or even meeting somebody. It's having that intimate knowledge. So if we're thinking about the definition for knowing God, it means we're to have a knowledge of God experientially, relationally, spiritually, and personally, defining what it means to know God. 
Uh, to know God, first and foremost, requires that we have, yes, the knowledge of Jesus, but a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, his Holy Son. So if you're to think about a definition of knowing God, well, it comes down to knowing Jesus, defining what it means to know God. Well, that comes to the demonstration of knowing God. Uh, look back at our, our source text. I want to read verses 3 through 5. Uh, again, uh, by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Uh, he who says, I know him, and here's the example, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. The demonstration of knowing God goes back to our obedience to his word. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John chapter 14 and verse 15. In John 14 and verse 27, Jesus also says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. John teaches both in his gospel and here in, in this epistle uh, that if we're going to know the love of God, we have to be obedient to God, obedient to Jesus Christ, who indeed is God. We are, are lying to ourselves if we say, I love you, Jesus, and we live how we want to live, and it's contrary to the word of God. Do you, who do you no. In James chapter 1, verse 22, we're reminded, but be ye doers of the word uh, and not hearers only deceiving yourself. Not only are we to go to church and listen to messages preached, not only are we to uh, read God's word and say, yep, I read it. Uh, I've read through the Bible a number of times. Uh, that That is meaningless if you don't have the spirit of God in your heart to discern the reading of God's word and the teaching of God's word. And it is meaningless if you fail to obey the word of God. Of God. Are you demonstrating that you know him? So we've looked briefly at the definition for knowing God. It's having that personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We've looked at the demonstration for knowing God. Do you demonstrate knowing God in your life? But what about the development that comes with knowing God? Again, in verse 6, uh, let me read that verse. It says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Uh, in other words, if we abide in Christ, and if we say we abide in Christ, then we should be walking as Jesus walked. We should be doing as Jesus did. That development that comes with knowing God is us abiding in Christ. That's the, uh, it describes the Christian continuance in our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The development that comes with knowing God. Paul wrote about uh, uh, Jesus not only knowing but doing the will of God. And he says he even did it. He was obedient to God, the will of God even to death, or to death, even death upon the cross. How obedient are you to the will of God? Are you allowing that development to take place because you are abide, abiding in him, abiding in his word? The development that comes with knowing God. Who do you know? So the first distinction, uh, uh, distinction is the evidence of uh, the evidence provided, uh, which gives to us a, a, a definition, demonstration, and development of knowing God. And the question still remains: Who do you know? Are you demonstrating? Are you allowing uh, the development? Are you abiding in Christ so that the development of the Holy Spirit and His Word and Christ in you uh, can be enhanced? Who do you know? Here's the second uh, distinction. Not only do we look at the evidence provided, but secondly, the expectation provoked. The expectation provoked. Look now, if you will, at uh, verses 7 through 11. Um, 
Let me read those. Brethren, <clears throat> I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him, that being Christ, and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The expectation provoked. Those who know God must love their brother. Um, the reference to uh, towards loving one's brother is a generic term for loving one another, especially those who are in the Christian faith. Jesus taught his disciples. Remember in John chapter 13, verse 35, by this they will know you are my disciples if you love one another. He was telling us that there ought to be a love amongst the brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, where people look at our love for each other and then the world will know that we are truly followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, John restated the teachings that he personally received by Jesus in the Gospels, as recorded in the Gospels, by stating, he who loves his brother abides in the light. Jesus is the light, abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Uh, there's some confusion over this passage for uh, John first states, I write no command, uh, new commandment to you. And then again, he says, again, a new commandment I write to you. Is it old? Is it new? Well, one might say it's both. It's both old. We have always been taught <clears throat> that we are to love one another, but it is new because now it is God who loves us, God who is love, God who loves us, now places his love in us. The love of Christ is inside of us. And so it is new in that it is given a new emphasis. There is a new light within us. There's a new love. It's the expectation provoked. So with that in mind, uh, what really is new? Well, let me share a, a few new things with you. Number one, it, it should be new in priority. Although there are many who uh, do not obey the law, it can be said that according to the law, parents are to care for their children. We would probably all uh, agree with that. We are called to care for our children. And the law tells us we have to care for our children because if we don't, then we can are subject to the law and neglect of our children. Uh, again, uh, many parents probably don't uh, obey that law, uh, but nonetheless, the law is still there. Uh, now, how many of us parents here tonight have ever awoken to the alarm clock and, partic uh, and, and participated in a conversation such as this? Here it goes. Honey, the wife might say, you had better get up and go to work. You don't want to get arrested today. To which perhaps you might reply, yeah, uh, and you had better get the kids dis uh, dressed, fed, and off to school. We might go to jail if we don't do that. According to law, we better take care of our children. And then we get up and go about our days, making sure we do things because the law taught us to. The point is simply this. That's ridiculous. I do not need the law to teach me to love my children. I get up and through those years in the military and I went to work because, yes, I wanted to serve my country. I love my country, but I did it because I love my family. I did it because I love my wife. I love my children. I don't need the law to teach me about love. See, there is a new priority. When you and I have Jesus in our hearts, we have a new priority. We've got the love of God. And we abide in the word of Christ. We abide in the word of God because we have a new priority. We love one another because we have a new priority. John refers to an old commandment which you have had from the very beginning. And then he says it's a, a new commandment in verse 8. See, the commandment is the same. 
The difference is we have a new motivation to obey. We have the love of God within us. So we have a, a new priority that is not really of the law, but it's the love of God in us. There's also a new pattern, which new in pattern. Look again at verse 8, if you will. Verse 8 it says, um, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Listen, we have a new pattern. I mentioned earlier that in, <coughs> excuse me, First John chapter 4, verse 8, as well as verse 16, the word of God says, God is love. And Jesus Christ embodies the very love of God. If you want to understand what love is, look to Jesus. You see, he's our pattern. Jesus, uh, uh, John, in writing this epistle, relied upon the pattern that he followed personally and that he saw every day during that three, three and a half year span as Jesus lived with them, taught them, died for them. We have a, uh, it's new in pattern, this love that we have. New in priority because we have a new motivation, Christ in us. New in pattern because we have a new example before us, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who, who teaches us as he did in, in the Sermon on the Mount that we're even to love our enemies. We have a new pattern. And then we have a new practice. Uh, John in, in verses 9 through 11 reiterates that hatred towards one another is contrary to walking in the light. Uh, John begins this epistle in, in chapter 1 about walking in light and not in darkness. You see that contrast. That contrast comes back into play here in this passage when he tells us that we're still to be walking in the light. And oh, by the way, if we're walking in the light, but we have disdainment, if we have hatred for our fellow brethren, then there is a problem. In fact, he says in this passage, you're lying. See, we have a new practice. And that practice is to, to love God and to love others, to love uh, one another so that the world out there will know that we are followers of Jesus Christ, that we are his disciples. John is just taking what he heard from the very mouth of Jesus and he's placing it in this epistle. You understand, no doubt you've been told before that there are, are two primary uh, relationships or directional relationships. We have a vertical relationship and a horizontal relationship. That goes all the way back to the command, two great commandments. The vertical relationship is our relationship with God. Our horizontal relationship is our relationship with one another. You and I, we have to have a relationship with God and only when we have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ will we ever have the right relationship with one another. And our Christian walk is to demonstrate this relationship. Uh, this love we are to have uh, is there because it is new, because it is new in priority. We're motivated because the love of Christ is within us. It is new in, in practice, or I'm sorry, new in, in pattern because we have Jesus Christ who is our ultimate example of love. And it is new in practice because he tells us we're to love one another. The evidence provided is found in our relationship with God and the expectation presented is found in the Christian love that we must exhibit in our daily life. So the question still remains, who do you know? That brings us to the third distinction given in this passage. Uh, it's referred to as, or I am referring to it as the experience proved the experience proved. Uh, let me read again verses 12 through 14. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for, for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is, uh, who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Uh, these verses may seem somewhat out of place, 
uh, they do seem to have a strong connection with some of the previous verses. Uh, they don't seem to have a strong connection with the previous verses, uh, nor do they seem to connect us entirely to the verses that will follow, which we'll study next week. Uh, however, after giving his readers a stern warning about knowing God, through obedience and love, John seems to be reassuring his readers that they are, in fact, Christians. Um, essentially, we find here the experience proved. There are three primary elements experienced here. Um, let's, let's go ahead and look at these uh, three primary experience uh found here or elements found in the experience proved. Uh, first of all, there's the forgiveness from God. Uh, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Now, because of the construction here, uh, some might think, uh, well, if he's saying little children uh, and he's referring later to young men and later to, uh, to fathers, uh, then he's just talking to little children, but that's not what it is. He's referring to all those who follow Jesus Christ. Uh, little children, listen, your sins are forgiven you. He's already talked about the forgiveness of sin here in his epistle when he, when he wrote in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the first element in, in the experience proved is that our sins are forgiven. But secondly, he talks about fellowship with God. Uh, three times John repeats, because you have known him. We talked about that word know or known, that experience, that relationship, that practical application of knowing someone close and upfront and personal and intimate. Uh, we are known our Father. The reminder to all of us is that our obedience to the command of God is evidence that we know him. And because we have that evidence in our lives, because we know him, we have fellowship with him. We can walk in the light. And if we walk in the light, as it says in, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light and we have fellowship, listen, with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. There is forgiveness from God. That's, that, that's ex evidence. That's experiencing uh, our experience in our relationship with God proved we have his forgiveness, but we also have fellowship with God. Um, John, First uh, John chapter 1, verse 3, we're reminded that we have, we have seen and heard. We declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, when you have fellowship with us, he says, and truly our fellowship with the Father is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. If we have fellowship with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, that's evidence that we are also in fellowship with Christ and in fellowship with God. Uh, here's a third element of this experience. As he's, uh, as John is encouraging his readers, uh, and that is uh, we are followers of God. Verse 13, it says, because you have overcome the wicked one. Uh, at the conclusion, verse 14, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. As followers of God, listen, we are strong in Christ. As followers of God, we have the words of Christ within us. As followers of, cry, of, of, of God, we can overcome the evil one. As followers of Christ, in first... Uh, we can overcome the tribulations of the, in this world. Remember what Jesus says in John 16 and verse 13. These things I have spoken to you that, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. Be of good cheers, for I have overcome the world, Jesus tells us. The words of Christ remain within the minds, within the mind of John. As he wrote this wonderful epistle. In a few weeks we'll be studying 1 John chapter 5 verses 4 and 5. Where he gives us this encouragement. This assurance. He says for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that he has. Uh, that has overcome the world. Our faith. 
Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. We have the assurance as followers of Christ that we too shall overcome. Who do you know? The answer to this question is of eternal importance. Does your life show evidence of knowing God? Uh, Do you understand the expectations that come with knowing God? And do you have the assurance in your life that you have experienced knowing God? See, it's my prayer that each one of us uh, has a personal relationship with Christ. And that in that personal relationship, we will know, God will show us that we will see demonstrations in our lives that we do, in fact, have a relationship with Christ. Because it is in that relationship we have the promise of eternal life. It is in that relationship that condemnation will never be ours. Um, Who do you know? Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with the teaching of your word. Thank you for your spirit who is our teacher and our guide. Thank you, Lord God, for your encouragement to us through your word, especially during these difficult times. And Lord God, thank you that you not only promise us that you have a relationship with us through your son, but Lord, we can experience, we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are your children. We love you and praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do hope that you have a wonderful rest of the week. Uh, Remember to keep on uh, reading God's word and going to him in prayer. Remember our uh, 2020 challenge. So uh, start reading. We're in uh, Psalms today. We're in in, uh, Psalm chapter 9 and as well as Romans chapter 9. So uh, contact me if you have any questions or if you have any any thoughts you might want to share with me uh, from that. And I look forward to meeting with you on Sunday as we worship an almighty God uh, together. God bless you.